All right, welcome back, Bio2 students. Uh, today we're going to talk about this guy, Carl Linnaeus, who was a Swedish botanist, physician, and zoologist, and he's also known as the father of modern taxonomy, which we're going to talk about today. And, and since it's the first time maybe of you seeing this, what's going to happen in your particular case is you're going to have a copy of these PowerPoints, and you're going to have these red words missing, and it's up to you as you are watching this video or taking notes in class to make sure that you fill in the red words that are missing so that you are kind of getting ready for quizzes and tests and that sort of thing. So anything in red is a really good idea to make sure you know for sure uh, because that's probably what I'm going to put on fill in the blanks or multiple choice or short essay and that sort of thing. It's not necessarily always that way but it's a good idea. And once again, you'll hear me mention this several times, but in many ways I view this as it being like a game. There's a certain number of points and your goal is to win the game by getting the most number of points like you would playing any other kind of game. And it's up to you to learn how to play the game very well. I'm gonna to try to show you that. All right, so Carl Linnaeus, father of taxonomy, Swedish botanist, physician, and zoologist. He wrote Systeme Naturae in 1735, and that was sort of the starting point by which we started naming and classifying organisms. And we don't quite do it exactly the same way now, but you'll be familiar with the kingdom and the phylum and the class level of things. Since then, there's a group of scientists um, that work on what they call cladistics, and it's sort of a combination of cladistics and taxonomy with it. And they form these diagrams or charts based on similarities and differences, which we call synapomorphies. These are shared derived characteristics that certain animals have and others don't. And by looking at those or similarities in DNA, they build these charts based on how they think these organisms are probably related to one another. So that's called a, a cladogram. And any grouping of those, anywhere where you can clip, you know, if you take scissors and you clip off one of those branches of that cladogram, also called a tree, anywhere you clip that, that grouping is a group or a clade. And that usually corresponds to kingdoms and phylums and classes. And that thing with cladograms is they tell you how one organism is related to another based on characteristics, but it doesn't tell you anything about time. It doesn't tell you when the branch split or when the evolutionary event occurred that led to that split. So sometimes you'll see what are called ultrametric trees, which is the same idea Instead, the branches have times associated with it. So in this particular case, you can see there's some geological timescale information imposed upon, superimposed upon the cladogram, and we call those ultrametric trees. When taxonomists are using cladistics to form groups, they're very specific about calling a group only a group if it's what's called a monophyletic group. So a true grouping is only real according to cladistics if it's a monophyletic group. A monophyletic group is a group that includes the most recent common ancestor and all the descendants. That's a monophyletic group. So you can see in purple or blue or whatever color that is right there, D and E, that forms a nice monophyletic group. So in a polyphyletic group, you see B and C, um, are related to one another, but they don't share the most recent common ancestor. They have A and B have a common ancestor, and C and D and E have a common ancestor, but the two of them alone do not share a common ancestor. So that's a polyphyletic group. Whereas in a paraphyletic group, they have a common ancestor. They share a most recent common ancestor, B, C, D, and E. So that's all fine, but because you're excluding A, Let's say, for example, you had this example here. Let's say B is crocodiles and C is lizards and D is turtles and E is snakes. And you're going, that's a group right there. Well, um, if A is birds and birds, it turns out, are related to crocodiles, if you don't include birds in that, then you can't do that. That's a paraphyletic group. So 
cladistics people will argue that doesn't exist. Okay, that's just the rules. That's how they do it. Okay, what is newer probably to you is this professor here, Carl Woos, a uh, professor at University of Illinois, who in 1977, so it's not even all that new, came up with a, a, a solution to a taxonomic problem that has happened for a long period of time, which is what to do with certain bacteria that are related to or not as closely related to these other groups of organisms called the archaea that we used to call the ancient bacteria. And Carl Woos and his MD and PhD, guy did an MD and did two years. The guy finished his MD, you know, went to Yale, got a degree in math and physics, did his MD for two days of residency in pediatrics, and he quit. He's like, that's it. Went back, got a PhD, and went on to be a professor. And Carl Woos came up with the three domain system, and that became official in 1977. And then it took, you know, another probably 20 years or so before that became mainstream in textbooks. So what you're used to, the Kingdom Phylum class, that's how I learned it. Well, since 1977 and then slowly making it into all the textbooks is there's another level now they call the domain system and so everything you'll learn will be in this three domain system the bacteria the eukarya and the archaea and we'll talk about those as we go and that is the new three domain system which again has been around since 1977 but it probably wasn't until the 1990s that it became kind of mainstream. And then, you know, depending on who your uh, high school or college professors were after that, depending on how in touch they were with the changes, you end up, you know, getting that later. So we've been using it now probably 15 years or 20 years, but anyway, it goes back to 1977. You can thank Carl Woos for that. Okay, now taxonomy, the reason I'm pointing this out right now is that taxonomy is one of those things that is going to potentially always be something that you can be working on because in Bio 2, um, in this course, we do a lot of taxonomy. Taxonomy is always fair game. So we'll have an organism out and I might ask you what domain it's in or what group it's in or what supergroups it's in, and we'll talk about those as we go. So this taxonomy you see here is just for the first practicum. So I think by week three, usually, we have this first practicum, which covers this taxonomy. And so you're gonna need to know this soon. It's not a bad idea to start learning some of this taxonomy, so you're ready. Um, there are two things right there you can start on. You can start on taxonomy, you can start on the geological time scale, which I mentioned in my last video, and you can have those ready somewhat before we even start the first day of class. So if you're sitting around playing video games and watching too much Netflix and not being productive, this is a good chance to sort of get ahead. Anyway, I'll stop there. I hope everyone's having a good day. Looking forward to seeing everybody soon and have a good rest of your break.